All right, so I am here with Corey Stevens of Stevens Bee Company, and you specialize in VSH queen rearing. So yeah. Varroa sensitive hygienic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been doing my homework on you, so I've got some questions for you. And I'd like to start by saying that VSH is not a bee, it is a trait. Yep, it's a trait set. Yep. Yeah, bees have lots of traits. So uh, this is gonna this is gonna be important as we get into this. You can have bees that are defensive. You can have bees that are gentle. You can have bees that make a lot of propolis. Bees that forage earlier in the day. Bees that forage at colder temperatures. Bees that make a lot of honey. Bees that make a little honey. VSH is a trait set. Right. So whatever the right bee is for a certain beekeeper. VSH can be added to their bees. Right. Yeah, John Harbo, I think they f figured it out in the late 90s, the USDA ARS B lab, and Dr. John Harbo is the one that pinpointed it and figured it out. Yeah. And he classifies it as an additive trait. So you could have VSH Caucasians, VSH Carnies, VSH Italians. You can have really crappy VSH bees. <laughs> you can have awesome, productive VSH bees. So, like you said, it's it's all over the board. And I'm trying to get the ones that are productive, you know. And that, gentle and fun to work and yeah. build up and make honey. Yeah, and, I want it all. Yeah, <laughs> all, all of that. Yeah. But are also VSH. <laughs> right. So yeah. I've got some questions specifically on what you do to select genetics. And we were talking mm -hmm. some about this earlier. So yeah. what what's the first thing you look for? Is it gentleness or? No, I mean, I like my bees. I don't like to wear gloves. So I like them to be workable, but occasionally like I'll, cr I'll make a unrelated cross, for instance, like, you know, in the, in the past I've produced or uh, crossed like the mite biters from mm -hmm. Purdue with like a high VSH line. And it seems like neither one of them were aggressive, but whenever I made that cross, seems like some of the first generation are so i mean i work to get that out you know what i mean but yeah. it seems like and that's why another reason i wanted to quit bringing stuff in or making crosses and just let the model run itself because um, aggression's annoying you know especially if you got new beekeepers buying your bees and you know i'd rate mine i can dig through this whole yard you know and not wear gloves but there's some if you're a rough handler there'll be a couple get on you, you yeah. know what I mean? And I think as the, as I go through the generations, I can get rid of more of that. But, uh, you know, I'll occasionally have a report of somebody getting a queen that a little spicy, you know? Yeah. All right, so in selecting genetics, what's the mm -hmm. first thing that you look for? What's the first trait? They need to be productive. Um, so they need to make a honey crop. They need to make a honey crop. I like bigger colonies, you know, so to where... able to split out of them. Absolutely. They need to be commercially to viable. Crop. Exactly. So commercially viable or productive, I would say, you can make a honey crop off of them. You can make splits off of them. You know, they'll get... Their <clears throat> colonies will get bigger. Like, I want them to be disease resistant, too. So, you know, my number one... I guess, I don't want to say weapon, but tactic, you might say, is as soon as I see something I don't like, a hint of disease or a breed pattern that doesn't look right, queen gets replaced immediately. So, I don't want to put words in your mouth here, mm -hmm. but I, I'm just sitting here thinking that um, your first selection criteria is survival. It is. Because yeah. you are running a treatment-free... Yeah program yeah. here you do yeah. not treat for varroa mites you no. do not use antibiotics for no. your pen foul brood or any medications whatsoever correct and i'm not dogmatic about that i don't tell people they should do it that way uh do you look at swarminess at all yeah i don't like them to be real swarmy but at the same time i've it, you know it's I, hard to have one without some of the is. other they said you know one breeder said i forget who it was i can't quote who it was but they said breeding bees that don't want to swarm is like breeding dogs that won't eat bacon yeah you know it's reproduction they're like rabbits exactly they, yeah. they want exactly <laughs> that's what they, makes them happier it, than anything yeah i mean it's reproduction you want them to be able to reproduce too but at the same time I think uh, they said basically low swarminess or like if you find a colony 
that make they'll make a half a dozen cells or mm -hmm. something you know or you'll find some that make 20 30 like there's just cells everywhere yeah. and so i think like picking the ones that are just less inclined to it until they get really big yeah you know and then you're gonna have to manage it anyway but yeah, yeah low swarming tendency you can make almost any colony swarm but some yeah. of them fight you on it exactly from the beginning and some don't even get that big and they throw yeah. a swarm that's really annoying because it's yeah. harder to predict and they're just not productive so do all of your breeders have to go through winter before mm -hmm. you will breed from them yes so they all have to overwinter they yeah they got to go survive through. a full season with yep. no mite treatment and looking good yeah exactly good. and i don't take a lot of alcohol washes I'd, I'd like to add that more but it comes down to time or resources yeah. um we talked about like i do vsh assays so i use dr john harbo i name dropped him he's the one that figured out vsh and he put out a here's how to test them the vsh assay what you this is the final you said this is the final step in right your program they have to go through winter i have to like them they have to show no sign of disease no sniffles no hiccups zero be productive and then the, after going through winter and they're i can tell they're coming out you know what i mean the ones yeah. that go in the springtime are responsive to nectar flows i test those my favorites that passed master beekeeper approval then the last hurdle is a vsh assay and then after that that determines who we graft out of and who's drone producers as well yeah. so i only use high scores for the maternal and paternal line now the vsh assay you are taking counting 100 cells of emerging brood that you can usually get a good score with 100 sometimes you have to go to 200 and you're just pulling the capping yep. off Mm -hmm. removing the brood yep. and looking for mites yep exactly and, and seeing a mite is not necessarily a black mark but no. if you see baby mites in there that's a black mark that's a black yeah. mark well whenever vsh first came out they called it smr or yeah. suppressed mite reproduction they had no idea what what was happening but they're like those colonies are not letting the mites reproduce like the numbers are just staying flat yeah and they didn't know what it was, but they knew they were somehow suppressing mite reproduction. So whenever you do a VSH, VSH assay, you're technically measuring the bee's ability to suppress mite reproduction. So the colonies that go through winter are big and productive and will pull that brood sample out that hadn't been treated the previous year. That's another thing. <clears throat> Depends on your treatment regime but you can get false positives. Like if you just clean those things up and kill all the mites in it, you can get a pretty good VSH score. Cause they think, you know, it's based on the bees ability to do this themselves, not yeah. you intervening. And so that's one reason why I didn't treat. It's not because I think people shouldn't treat. You know what I mean? If you're gonna run healthy bees and you, I go by IPM, I'm an entomologist, trained entomologist, so I go off of IPM. If you're washing high loads or you're starting to see parasitic mite syndrome, you need to clean them up. But to me, I, it was blurring my vision. I couldn't see what the bees were able to do themselves. Yeah. And like we talked about too, if you look around, everything I've got is just standard. It's lang straw equipment, deep brood boxes, it's plastocell foundation. I didn't want it to be a mechanical fix, yeah. like, like small cell or something. I wanted it to or, be a uh, genetic. removing drone brood and freezing it. And exactly. I didn't like want that. it to be something that I was doing. I wanted to be able to measure what they're doing. You know, I have to do my part as a beekeeper to, you know what I mean, you're constantly having to super up and pull stuff or split or rear queens and that kind of stuff. But overall, I run it just like you would a normal operation. I just don't use any chemical modicides or antibiotics for that reason because that's what i was locked on as i wanted to breed for resistant yeah for host resistance you mentioned response to nectar flow mm -hmm. bees can respond to nectar flows in a lot of different ways it's true so what do you look for i like them to build i like them to brood up draw comb you know get their make their colony bigger basically because uh you know, we talk, I name dropped Tom Seeley, like Tom Seeley bees. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're cool, they survive, but they don't seem to be commercially viable. Yeah. You know what I mean? They have some type of resistance mechanism. It's not, that's not what I'm after. 
you know, I want to breed something that's commercially useful for beekeepers, but can handle its own too. I forget which book that was, but he recommended the way that you would keep bees treatment free as being in a single deep, yeah. small colony, yep. maybe get one super of honey out of them yeah. and let them swarm. Yeah. And that, that's how they would survive. Well, yeah. you know, me as the honey producer, I'm thinking I'd much rather get a hundred or 120 pounds of honey out of that colony. And a couple than splits maybe 35. even. five. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, so. And that's their, res that's their mechanism too, is it's like, it's almost like reduced brood rearing. Yeah. That's why they don't get so big and the mites don't reproduce as much. They just don't There's raise not as, as much bees. brood. There's right. not as much food for the mites there. Exactly. And so that's a tolerance or a resistance mechanism, but it's not the one I want to breed for, you know, is it useful? Sh sure. Well, you know, let's, but... ta let's talk about resistance mm -hmm. um, and the ways that honeybees are resistant to yeah. mites. Oh yeah. There's several we know of. So, uh, small colony size yep. is a resistance Reduced mechanism. Reduced brood rearing, yep. Frequent swarming. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, frequent absconding. Exactly. Think think about Africanized yeah. honeybees. How yeah. do they survive with mites? Right. Nobody can get close enough to the hives to treat them. Right. <laughs> so, so they don't. But I've read in some instances, like I think it was a Page Laidlaw book, that uh, Africanized bees are typically pretty hygienic. Like. Obviously, there's going to be a gamut. You're going to have some that yeah. are not at all, but I think as a whole, they've got, they're super swarmy too, but I think they're also uh, pretty sensitive to brood issues and stuff. Generally speaking, yeah. it's hard to paint any bees with a broad brush stroke. You know, it's like people will say, oh, Italians will eat themselves out of house and home. Yeah, some of them. Some, <laughs> some of them won't, you know. So. You've got swarminess, absconding, hygienic behavior. Allo grooming, auto grooming, general hygiene, varroa sensitive hygiene. What about brood breaks? Yeah, well that would fall under swarming in a natural sense. And well, I'm, that's I'm, a brood I'm break. talking about like responsiveness oh, do I? to nectar flow. Yeah. Uh, if well, you get a summer dearth like we do in the southeast, if the bees just stop laying yeah, brood. Yeah, that's what they'll do. Like a lot of mine just shut down. Or, and even sometimes that's why you don't want to just, during a nectar dearth, pull a frame and go, this cleans bad, the brood yeah. pattern looks rough. Because like if it's bad, bad, they'll eat the larvae or and shut down. Yeah. So like you'll just have kind of some rough looking brood, but then when the nectar comes back on, you're getting sheets again. See, here's a point yeah. I want to make. Mm. You you market VSH Italians. Yeah. Although but there's been... this connotation about Italians. Right. Yeah. That even in a nectar dirt, they're going to keep going, keep going, Not these, and yeah. fall off the cliff and starve to death. Yeah. And I may have had a few of those, but yeah. natural selection, natural selection is king in my apiary. People talk a lot about Carniolan versus Italian versus Caucasian versus Cordovan mm -hmm. versus Russian versus whatever. And this is a, this is a, a overarching point I want to make. Mm -hmm. Your Italians are different from a commercial beekeeper's totally. Italians who's going to almonds in California and then going to Texas and shaking packages yep. to send to Man Lake yep. to create tens of thousands of packages and then going into queen rearing and then going to Wisconsin and then going somewhere else and they're on a set treatment schedule. Right. They're feeding a ton, literally tanker oh, yeah. loads of yeah. syrup. Yep. Those Italians are going to make a whole lot of brood all year long because that guy needs packages. Right. And he needs bees to brood up in January. And there's no natural selection. Yeah, there's no hanging none. over them. It's not weeding out the outliers that are just go, 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 go nonstop. And if they hit a dart, they're dead. Yeah. You know? like He's actually selecting life. for that behavior. Exactly, not against it. So, so yeah, that's the, the beekeeper is going to select for genetics whether they know it or not his <laughs> management exactly exactly whether they know it or not you're yeah. selecting your bees the your... ones that die don't like your management yeah exactly yeah dead bees aren't worth much either yeah. you know at least i haven't found a market for them but you're exactly right and the thing is too is there's so much variation between lines caucasian carniolan you know like whenever people are like well i don't i wish he would raise carnies you know which i've actually after I started crossing some of my stuff with John Harbo's to get my VSH scores up there, I've got some that are a little darker. But they 
act pretty much exactly like the other ones. You know what I mean? You're just yeah. You're just you're breeding for behavior, not phenotype. Right. Yeah, Looks it, don't matter. Performance exactly. is all that matters. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm after too. And and I know a lot of people have those preconceived notions in their minds of Italians eating themselves out of house and home and yeah. Carn Carniellans never doing that. Or even Italians that are, because like if you look at the historical, some of the papers, they'll, they were like, we had this Italian line and the mite resistance was horrible. We yeah. had this Russian line that was probably selected for it that did better. Of course, because those weren't selected for it, but I've seen Italians that would put a lot of those Russians to shame. You know what I mean? As far as VSH scores. So, it's hard to paint a, uh, even a race of bee or people with a broad brush stroke. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's so it's much. A, it's individual indi colonies. Absolutely. Yep. So back to the the VSH, and I started off by saying that you can add VSH to mm -hmm. a population. Oh and yeah. You've got an interesting business model here because you don't sell mated queens. No, I stopped. I used to, but I stopped just for economic reasons you might well say. it's efficient it's efficiency reasons. absolutely i'll sum this yeah. up in, in my own words but um and i've taken this from a podcast you did several years ago mm -hmm. um it's it was time and equipment tied up to get a mated queen and make sure that she was performing properly yep and then you had a set price that you could sell her for in the market right and then you've got this queenless hive that you just pulled her out of. So I've got a problem to deal with. You've got a problem to deal with, <laughs> and it's just taking a lot of time for you to do that. And you thought, well, I can sell this nuke for enough money that it's not worth it to me to sell the queen out of the nuke. Right. I couldn't even do enough rounds of queens if it went perfect according yeah. to plan, which it never always does 100%. I couldn't do enough queens out of that nuke to justify if I just sold the nuke out of it the first time and then just made another one for me, I'm done. Like I was selling the heart out of the watermelon for 30 bucks or whatever. Well, nukes at the time were, I think I was selling them for 175. How many rounds of $30 queens out of that and how much labor do you have in that? Yeah. I was like, so it's just not your, worth your it. Your business model, I'm gonna use the watermelon because I mm -hmm. like that. So you've got a watermelon or you can go to the grocery store and you can get cut up watermelon the heart or you can go to the farm seed store and get watermelon seed yeah you are selling seed yeah and you are selling watermelons right you're not selling the cut up grocery store exactly so the it, using this analogy you sell nukes with a mated queen yep or you sell virgins yep. or queen cells right correct yeah, and like I would say, if I sold the mated queen, that was me selling the hard out of the watermelon. That's like yeah. the best part. I'm really interested in the virgins and the queen cells because this makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, getting virgins from you or queen cells from you, I put those in my mating nukes. Mm -hmm. They go out and mate with my local drone population. Yep. So my bees are automatically more locally adapted to Middle Tennessee than they are to Southeast Missouri. You got Tennessee VSH hybrids basically yeah. immediately. And yep. if I like my bees, well, they're mating with my drone stock. They're exactly. gonna keep a lot of those traits. Yep, and adding that But attitude. I'm adding VSH right. into them and the drones from these queens are going to be very strongly VSH. All. Well, if I did my work right, now obviously sometimes they'll, you know, there'll be a little drift maybe if, with catching drones or whatever, but you should have a an extremely high, if not all, of those drones from all of them should be VSH. So if you bought a hundred queens, a hundred colonies that those queens went into are just doing nothing but producing VSH drones. So your local population, that's from a, an artificially inseminated breeder. Yeah. Obviously, if you just keep grafting out of your best, which is a good practice, but you should also maybe do a little VSH testing too. And like we can put the links in the video to John Harbo's uh, how to test if somebody wanted to test mm -hmm. their own bees. It's not that difficult. And then I've got a little YouTube video too that I did like for my independent research for my entomology degree. Um, if you want to, you can link that too. If somebody wants to watch it and try it. But if you keep that pressure on there and then keep p picking your best Tennessee bees that are doing best in your area, 
you're gonna have your own unique VSH Tennessee brand of bees. How many generations does it take before that VSH gets washed out? It's difficult, like that's why I was encouraging people to test because if you keep that selection pressure on it, it could not go away at all. Yeah, but if you're just, you just kind of blindly, yeah. If, but you're, if you're, you're not looking at it, then within three or four generations, it's going to get diluted. It could, yeah. But the thing is, too, is like if you're going through and cleaning all your yards with them, and then they're just blowing VSH drones everywhere, well, even if you graft and they're flying around there, you know what I mean? So yeah. you're going to have residual. Well, I'm, I'm thinking for my operation particularly, I've got 40. 45 hives mm -hmm. right now something like that i may end up at 60 ish yeah I don't, that's good number. i don't want to get too big right. because I, I want it to be a fun thing you know it's a hobby yeah, it's, exactly it's fun. <laughs> yeah. i want it to make money and be profitable and be yeah. a real business but yeah. it's got to be fun it's got to yeah. fit into my life exactly and that's not, a good not just consume it that's a good number because i yeah. kind of went off the deep end and it started to consume me. <laughs> yeah <laughs> You get the, so I'm thinking specifically on my operation. Mm -hmm. If I brought in some VSH queens, especially if I use them in dr drone flooding yards. Oh yeah, for sure. Yep. You know, go three quarters of a mile or a mile in three directions from my home yard and set up five colonies in each. You're gonna have a big impact. Put VSH queens in those. Yeah. Get them set up, and then just graft out of my own best hives yep, exactly there's a good chance i'm going to lock that vsh into my my operation absolutely and if you picked your best hives that were your favorites and tested just the ones you're thinking about grafting out of and then picked the narrowed it even further these are the highest yeah and then keep doing that you got it going on so let's talk about testing for just a minute because there's different ways to test mites and you're doing a very time intensive yeah it takes about 20 minutes a colony yeah you're not testing for population of mites or percentage no. of mites in the hive you're, right. you're testing to see if they're actually reproducing right exactly so I'll, I'll point out a nuance between the two. Like I'm measuring the bees' abilities to suppress mite reproduction. I'm not taking into account mite loads, which is useful. Mm. I would like to do both, but if you have a, to pick between the two, I pick the SMR or the VSH because that's going to the root of it. Because in theory, you could have a colony that's robbing the heck out of some other yeah. high mite colonies and their mite load's gonna grow if you washed it, you would think that colony is no good. If you VSH tested it, it's the opposite. Hmm. It's really good. So that's why I think mite loads can be, I don't know that it's the best indicator of mite resistant. It's a yeah. good indicator. I don't think it's the best indicator, if that makes sense, because there's always a good, better, best. And I, I am doing something that's probably two steps back from what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So what, what I think most beekeepers do especially hobbyists and maybe small sideliners is they'll wash do a mite wash on maybe 10 percent of their colonies. yeah yeah a lot of commercial guys do that yeah. too because if and they tried to do all of them you know what i mean that's yeah, just it's too so time much work consuming. i know randy yeah. oliver does that yeah and yeah and that's if you're going to do it that's the way to do it yeah you know, exactly. that's the way to use my my numbers I'm doing something a little different. Um, I'm using oxalic acid vaporization mm -hmm. and then putting sticky boards underneath. Oh, cool, to see what the drop so is. So I'm yeah. sampling the entire hive, yeah. like how many phoretic mites are in this hive. So sticky boards have problems. Like I can't find a good substance to put on sticky boards. What do you use, Vaseline? Vaseline, yeah. Crisco, Pam. Uh, there's got to be some kind of spray adhesive that would be I would useful, think so. but those that mites, stays tacky. Yeah, th those mites move. They're quick. They're yeah. real quick. So yeah, I've seen them moving around on sticky boards, and oh yeah, I think they can get off of there. Yeah, dead mites don't. True. So, so you get kind of a total drop. Yeah, off get of a what total drop off. There. You know, three days after oxalic acid vaporization. I did that in my home yard um, last week. And had some hives with no mites. Yeah. And had some hives with hundreds. A lot. Yeah. Hundreds. Yeah. So I just went through and put a thumbtack on the ones that were good and a thumbtack on the ones that were bad. Yeah. Yep. And I think that's good data too, because you're measuring overall load, not even yeah. just a little sample. That's pretty smart what you're doing. I like that. Well, I think the, that's got the potential. thing is, instead of doing mite washes where I have to get into the brood nest and not kill the queen. Yeah. 
and kill 300 bees and yep. maybe I sampled the wrong 300 bees. Yeah. I sampled 300 bees with all the mites or 300 bees with none of exactly. the mites. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's hard for a new new beekeeper to for sure. To that's want advanced to get stuff. Into. Yeah, that's advanced stuff uh, for so, sure. Shooting it with OAV, you kill no queens. You get an idea of what how many in mites there. are in there. Yeah. And I can treat my entire yard in 20 minutes. Yep. Yep. It's it's so simple and easy Straight to do forward. it that way. I, I think it would be cool to couple that with if you're going to graft out of some, or you I don't know if you're doing a lot of queen rearing or if you've delved into it even. There. I'm I'm planning on getting into it next year quite a bit, and I'm, I'm using it as a grading system basically. Yeah. Like I will not. Um, I'm, I, I'm just not going to graft from a hive that had a high mite count. I think that's a good way to look at it too. You know, and, and it may be that they got a mite bomb and they're actually a hygienic hive and they're going to be okay, it but it's so be. easy to just knock them out. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of breeders that are only using washes. Yeah. So it's not a it's not a bad indicator. You know what I mean? It, it's it's you're definitely pulling the blindfold off and you're seeing what's going on in there. I'm just throwing a one off out there. You yeah. know that. And I've heard people say that, you know, that they ran across one that the mite level was like high just for a brief period, maybe during robbing or whatever, yeah, but yeah. that they tested high, but then they, the colony survived and they went back later and the mite levels were low again. So it was just a fluke, you know, like they were just, somehow they were picking them up, a ton of them, but they were shutting the reproduction down too. So. That's well, why I think it's it, it's the best indicator, but there's other indicators too that are good. Yeah. Well, yeah, that is a good indicator. I like that approach you took. I think that's intelligent. Definitely useful information. But it's it's useful information. It's not. I don't even know if it's scientific information because you don't know the denominator. I can't get a percentage of these. Yeah. Uh, or a percentage of mites per 100 honeybees. Well, that's if you're looking for. I mean, you're looking at it kind of from a breeding, which one to graft out of. The percentage is just an IPM thing because yeah. it's finding that threshold. Do I have a problem? Is it worth it to treat it? You know, it's just intelligent uh, chemical application. So you're not just throwing it out there if there's no problem because that's yeah. what causes resistance. You know, it's mite resistance to chemical miticides. It's whenever you're just constantly putting it in their face. You know, and then they develop a resistance. This is like IPM's like I'll use it if I need to use it. But also, if you look at IPM, everybody glosses over the fact that one of the main foundations, a freaking cornerstone of IPM is host resistance. Yeah. That's like what if you don't have to get to. Yeah, if you don't have host resistance, like the whole IPM thing, you might as well just treat regularly. I mentioned um I've been saying a lot about selecting genetics. Mm -hmm. The your bees that you like, you can add traits, you can select for different things. And I talked about my sampling technique for mites. Yeah. Um, that was actually I use OAV for my mite treatments, mm -hmm. generally July August. Yeah. And um, I'm sampling afterward to see if it was effective, and also to grade hives and see if. You know, did it work, or the yeah. hives that are still in what? trouble, or, or whatever? That's pretty um, sharp. So I think the um, the ones I've got that are zeros could that part of that at least could be due to re response to nectar flow, because for six weeks before that we were in a dearth. I mean, a hard drought, and you've been in a hard drought here. Oh yeah, yeah, and. It, and we get a drought most Julys. Yeah. You know, most Julys in August. So those bees may be working with my management style mm -hmm. because they shut down brood lane during the drought. All the mites are exposed, and then yeah. I come through with oxalic acid, knock them down, and wipe them out. Yeah. And those bees are now in great shape going yeah. into the fall nectar flow, whereas yep. some others it may have had the the typical commercial Italian. Where they still got brood. They got brood everywhere. Yeah. You know, maybe they carried higher mite loads because my treatments were ineffective on those hives. Quite possible, yep. So it, it's, it's the beekeeper's got to work with the bees and the bees have got to work with the beekeeper. Yeah, it's a symbiotic uh, on, relationship. On this. So I yeah. think that's just fascinating. And there's so many things that you can work toward in this. Um, I want to talk about selecting for honey production. Mm-hmm. 